The next session is on expenditure reform in industrialized countries. Uh, we're honored to have Dr. Sebastian Hauptmeier from the European Central Bank, and he'll be presenting results from a paper uh, with several co-authors, and I'll let him name. So, Dr. Hauptmeier. Okay, so first let me thank uh, the organizers of this conference for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm happy to uh, um, discuss with you this recent paper I did together with um, Jesus Sanchez Fuentes from Madrid University and Ludger Schuknecht, who is also um, at the ECB. So what are we talking about? It's, we're talking about expenditure reform in, in advanced uh, economies. This paper I'm presenting today is actually uh, based on a study we did back in 2007. And this study um, kind of has its roots in the, in the literature on, um, on the determinants of successful fiscal consolidation. So we have people like Alberto Alesina and Perotti who contributed with quite a few influential papers to this literature. And the bottom line of this, of this uh, line of literature is basically that, I mean, if you want to lastingly um, improve fiscal positions, you should focus on the expenditure side, and you should also get the, uh, the composition of the adjustment right. So based on, on these, um, let's say, these messages from this, uh, from this literature, we had a closer look. So we did a case study approach. We identified certain periods of large expenditure reductions in industrialized countries in the 80s and the 90s. And we, we, we wanted to analyze what are the specific features that, that make these um, expenditure reduction um, strategies particularly successful. And the idea of, of, of this paper and, um, is basically to use the insights from this old paper and, uh, and see and assess recent reform plans that have been um, put forward by several European countries. And we will also discuss, of course, um, latest fiscal developments uh, in, the, in the US in this context. So I'll just No? Ah, okay. So let me start by uh, stating the obvious. I mean, as you all know, public finances and many advanced economies at the current state are in, in, in very bad shape. Why is that? Well, we had uh, a lot of counter-cyclical fiscal policies during the crisis, so discretionary fiscal stimulus, but also the automatic reaction of, of public budgets uh, to the severe recession. We had Quite especially in Europe, we had quite substantial financial stabilization measures to, to uh, um, deal with problems in the banking sector during the crisis. And another problem that we were facing is actually that a lot of countries, when entering the crisis, were al already in relatively bad shape. So this you can see in the charts, for example, on the fiscal balance uh, in the, on the left-hand side, you see that both the euro area, the UK, and the US all entered the crisis already with um, relatively sizable deficits. So that amplified the deterioration in public um, budgets. So we see between in the period 2007 to 2010, we see the euro area uh, general government deficit increasing to 6% of GDP in the US and the UK even increased to, to, 10, to more than 10%. And as a consequence, of course, public debt has been put on a um, steep upward path. So the euro area gross debt ratio increased by 20% um, in the UK and the US between 2007, even 30% of, uh, of GDP. And what, what makes these um, recent developments particularly worrisome is that a lot of these countries are also facing uh, quite huge aging-related fiscal burdens. I mean, we discussed about um, projections for healthcare spending in the US uh, yesterday. So this is an additional burden put on, on, on public finances, which add to the sustainable sustainability risk. And in addition, the, the recent financial sector stabilization measures um, add to the risk because contingent liabilities could lead to future costs also. So I would state that at the current stage, there's an urgent need for, for fiscal consolidation, and this holds in particular for, for European countries. In fact, most of the countries uh, in, in Europe at the moment don't really have an uh, other option than consolidating at the moment because financial markets are putting uh, enormous pressures via um, bond spreads and so on on these countries. But also in the US, 
the situation is, of course, uh, somewhat uh, different. I mean, financing costs for U.S. government is, are still relatively low, despite of the high uh, debt and deficit um, ratios. But, I mean, we also discussed this, this yesterday. This will not stay like that forever. No? It's sometime in the future, uh, interest uh, rates will go up, and then the U.S. government at some point will have to make up its mind how to restore sound fiscal positions in the future. So what we do in this, with this paper, we argue that a promising recipe for, for um, restoring sound fiscal position is to do expenditure adjustment, and you should have expenditure adjustment as part of a more comprehensive eco economic reform package. Um, we assess the adjustment strategies of some Euro um, area member states that have been put forward recently um, against the insights we got from our case study a paper I um, talked about uh, before. And we find that, in fact, some countries already have um, such comprehensive policy reform programs in place, others not, uh, um, and this also includes um, the U.S. So let me quickly talk about uh, long-term uh, public expenditure trends. So what you see in this table are expenditure to GDP ratios for uh, quite a few OECD countries. What you see is that the aggregate spending ratios in, in a lot of, um, uh, in the euro area, but also in the G7 and the OECD, didn't change all that much between 1980 and 2007. But we have quite some uh, cross-sectional differences here. So in particular, in, in some European countries, so France, Greece, Italy, Portugal, and Spain, we saw quite some increases in expenditure ratios. And then, of course, came the shock uh, of, the, of the crisis, and um, expenditure made another jump, so by on average 5% of GDP. And that's why quite a few countries at the moment are at or close to um, historical peaks um, regarding the government size. So one can, one can state that um, the developments in, in government spending as a ratio to GDP was one of the main determinants of, of the large uh, fiscal uh, deterioration in advanced economies, and that's only natural to, to then try to solve these fiscal imbalances by looking at the spending side. So I will quickly give you an overview of uh, the paper we did in, in 2007. So I already explained what we did. We wanted to find large expenditure uh, reduction episodes. So the criterion we set here was to ask for an expenditure reduction of more than 5% in, in seven years. So that uh, basically led us to identify 12 um, so-called ambitious reform periods um, we found. And um, these reform periods took place in two waves, some in the 80s, some in, in the 90s. Bottom line is that the reduction of expenditure to GDP was actually quite substantial. So it was on average 10% in the, some of the, in the Nordic countries, for example, in Finland and Sweden, we had 14% reduction of expenditure to GDP in, uh, in seven years. So I said the composition of adjustment is important. So here in this table you can see the primary expenditure reduction over the seven-year period, and then you can see the, the composition, so which budget items were actually um, corrected. And what we can see here is that a lot of countries very strongly focused on transfers and subsidies. So this means streamlining social benefit systems, um, tighter eligibility criteria, means testing, and so on, to reduce spending pressures in, in, in these systems. And on the other hand, government consumption, in particular the wage bill, so a reduction not only of wages, but also cuts in government uh, employment overall. So this is basically explaining uh, two-thirds of the expenditure reduction on average over these uh, ambitious reform period. On the other hand, if you look at government investment and education to spending items that one could uh, call high quality, um, there the reductions were um, at least not disproportionately. So I said spending adjustment as part of a broader economic reform program, and that's what happened in, in a lot of the countries. So we had, on the one hand, one pillar of the reform was reducing public expenditure in key items. Another pillar was to complement the, the spending reduction with uh, high-quality reform. So in particular, institutional reform, strengthening of um, budgetary frameworks, and so on. Um, quite a bit of structural reform, so labor market reform to increase flexibility, and so on tax reforms to improve the, the growth friendliness of the tax system, and also quite a few of the countries also engaged in quite a bit of privatization. So what were the fiscal and macroeconomic effects of these, um, of these reform? We can see on the upper uh, left-hand side that ambitious reformers uh, actually managed to at least stabilize, or in the case of, of the late um, ambitious reform group, so this is the 
um, the, the gray line, you can see that they even managed to reduce um, the debt to GDP ratio significantly um, below the starting level. What is interesting to see here is that quite a few indicators um, that, that measure kind of macroeconomic performance during the um, expenditure reduction period actually improved. So this is something which uh, um, is not uh, obvious. So we see that during the reform period, actually trend growth increased at least at some point. We see that also real private consumption started from very from negative levels, but actually during the expenditure reform period, um, uh, it increased, and also real private investment. So it was not the fact um, that for this uh, very tightening fiscal policy stance that um, the economy was suffering a lot and on the demand side, for example. So this is the, basically the overview of the findings from our paper. So first of all, over the overall adjustment is important. Focus on spending and think big in a way. The composition is important, so you should target high quality um, in a high quality way, meaning that you, you have to also tackle politically sensitive items no? in order to show that the political willingness to really restore sustainability um, is there. And then also f you should focus on relatively unproductive spending items. And then finally, spending as a part of a broader economic reform program. So now these were the findings from the old studies, and now comes the part where we try to apply uh, these findings to new reform episodes. In this study, we focused um, on uh, seven European countries. So first of all, the um, three EU IMF program countries, which are, of course, uh, quite interesting and important at the current stage, so Greece, Ireland, and Portugal. We also have a look at uh, the, the large euro area countries, Germany, France, Italy, and Spain. And, uh, of course, we look at the United States and the UK. For the EU member states, we look at fiscal plans that have been um, put forward in the context of EU fiscal surveillance. So these are the so-called stability and convergence program, which give you the, the government, the medium-term government plan for fiscal developments. And in the, for the United States, we use the latest uh, IMF WIO projection. So what we can see from this is that actually all countries are planning relatively sizable expenditure reductions. So that starts around 3 to 4 percent over a period up to 2013 in Germany, France, Italy, and also the U.S., we have over 6% in the UK and in Spain. And in the, in the program countries, so in Greece, Ireland, and Portugal, we have on um, spending reduction, and targeted spending reductions of 65 to, to 10 percentage points. So that's quite a bit. Can I ask about the US percentage? 42% yeah. seems high to, to me, and I was wondering what the source that of is, that data is. That, that is the IMF data, and it's total general government expenditure as a ratio to GDP. That includes federal spending, state and local, and that's the, basically the most comprehensive way to, to measure the, the government size. And it actually increased, uh, that's in fact true, um, quite a bit. So it deviated quite a lot from historical standards in the US, which has been much lower recently. Okay, so based on the criteria we set up in this um, old paper, um, we basically identified Ireland, Greece, Portugal, Spain, and the UK as ambitious reformers, no? because they are above 5%. And of course, we also um, have a look at the U US, which actually stands out of one of the countries with, uh, which has the, 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 the highest increases in government deficit uh, and debt ratios. So in the paper, you will find um, country case studies uh, for all the countries we have identified. I mean, here, because I don't have uh, that much time, I will only focus on two. I will have a, look, a quick look at Greece, and then I will show you the U.S. So in Greece, the EU IMF program was um, adopted in May 2010. As you can see in the table, this gives you the, 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 the forecast. Um, the fiscal balance would improve by uh, more than 13 percent. That's the target. So it's a huge improvement in the fiscal position. 11% of GDP would, would come from spending. So that's a high share would come from spending, and the focus here would be on consumption um, and, uh, and social payments. So that means basically reducing the public sector wage bills, streamlining benefit 
uh, systems, cutting operational and def defense spending, and also some measures on the spending side, in particular increases in VAT. This is the first pillar. This is the consolidation pillar. The second pillar is the structural reform pillar. So the program uh, actually aims at um, to, to help Greece uh, regain its, its external competitiveness through labor market reforms, measures to improve the business environment, pension and health care reforms to improve sustainability, and quite a few other measures, including budgetary reform, but also large-scale privatization. So I have to... Okay, I will, I will go directly to the... To the U.S. I mean, these are the latest projections from from the IMF. What you can see that in the period 2009 to 2016, there are also quite some um, improvements in the in the fiscal balance um, projected there. So the deficit would decline from 12.8% in 2009 to around 6% of the end at the, to the end of the IMF projection horizon in 2016, meaning that the deficit in the medium term would stay at uh, quite eleva um, elevated level focus would be on government consumption and cuts in, in investment. The main measure here at the moment is, uh, of course, as we all know, the Budget Control Act, but the problem is that at the moment it's not really very well specified. So it's, it's, it's quite uncertain what, what will be the impact of this, uh, this reform on public finances. On the structural reform side, we, had the, we have the 2010 healthcare reform. As I learned, the imp so also the CBO suggests that uh, the budgetary impact of this reform will not be particularly large. And then we, of course, had these, uh, this reform of the financial regulatory, regulatory system, the Dodd-Frank Act. So what we do here is a horizontal assessment. So we compare fiscal and macroeconomic developments um, first for the group of the new ambitious reformers. So these are the ones we identified now, so the program countries, Spain and the UK, with the old ambitious uh, reformers from the, from the past. So we can kind of benchmark against uh, the developments from, from these successful episodes. And we also show the US. So what you can see here, first of all, um, this reform episode basically starts from a much, much worse fiscal position. Oh, this is what you can see on the upper uh, left-hand side, so both for the U.S. and for the new ambitious reformers, you have uh, double-digit uh, deficits. Um, in the case of the ambitious reformers, you see that actually the expectation is that this um, fiscal deficit will, will be um, reduced um, quite quickly, so even more quickly than um, the ambitious reformers did in the past. On the US, you see some improvement uh, up to the, to, to the third year. So this would be uh, in the case 2014, but then it's basically flat in the end. The difference between the, let's say, the new ambitious reformers and the old ones I talked about previously is that the new ones focus much more on government consumption, so on the wage bill while the old ones did more on transfers and subsidies. So that's a difference in composition. It's not clear whether this will have any qualitative impact. Another not so nice feature is that the, these new ambitious reformers also focus quite a bit on investment spending, no? which is probably not particularly helpful at the, at the current stage. On the other hand, in the US, first you see that the investment to GDP ratio, the public investment to GDP ratio is, uh, it starts from a higher level, but it also doesn't reduce uh, as much. We see that, on the other hand, that the government debt ratio stays on an increasing path for the U.S., so there's no stabilization of the debt ratio, while for the ambitious reformers of uh, the recent ambitious reformers, you see a stabilization already after three to four years. In the bottom line, you see real GDP growth and real private consumption growth. And this is actually a quite big difference between the old episodes and the new one, because as you can see here, the macroeconomic environment against, these, uh, against which these uh, expenditure reforms are taking place is mu much weaker. No? We have much lower GDP growth, which actually only turns positive after three years. Uh, the same ho uh, holds true for, for, real uh, government, uh, for real private consumption. So this is, of course, not helping the, the reform efforts. So overall, at the moment, it's, of course, tricky to, to talk about the quality of, uh, uh, of adjustment. It's uh, premature, but we can say, okay, the reform programs that have been put forward by some of the, the EU countries, so in particular the program countries, they are kind of similar to what um, our ambitious reformers did in the 80s and 90s. So it's a large reduction of government spending, so that's the main focus of the, of the fiscal improvement. There's a reasonable quality, so focus on consumption, but of course we also have the decline in, in government investment, and also the consolidation is taking place 
um, as part of a comprehensive reform program. So we have in all five countries here, we have uh, institutional reform. That's basically a strengthening of, uh, of uh, the budgetary uh, framework. We have financial sector reform as a response to the financial crisis. We have labor market reform in all f uh, five cases. And uh, we have, uh, in some cases, at least in particular in Greece, we have uh, privatization. So what are the conclusions for this? I will start with the, with the EU and the euro area, which is actually quite different, I would say. I mean, we can say that some of the program countries, at least, they have reform programs in place which could help to restore macroeconomic stability and, put, uh, and restore fiscal sustainability, if fully implemented. And this if is, of course, uh, quite uh, big at the moment, no? because the risk, especially for the, for the Greek problems, uh, for the Greek program, uh, are large. Many other countries are actually uh, lacking behind. Adjustment plans are backloaded, and they're kind of pushed on a constant um, matter by financial markets to, to, uh, to um, step up consolidation. So the thing is, I mean, at the moment, the, the challenge in, in Europe is very clear on fiscal consolidation. We have to restore um, sound fiscal positions uh, in, in order to be able to, to regain financial and macroeconomic stability. As I said before, in the U.S., it's, it's a bit different because still, despite of the relatively high debt level and also the dynamics, the underlying dynamics, still the financing conditions are relatively favorable. Um, we had quite a bit of an increase in the government size, also with respect to the pre-crisis level. Um, so all in all, at the moment, the situation is, that is not particularly worrying, but as we discuss later, you never know when financial markets basically turn bad on you. you know? So there could be some discrete change in the future where your finance, financing condition will rapidly deteriorate. And that's why I think that also the U.S. government already now should should start thinking about a, a well-defined medium-term fiscal adjustment strategy, just to show the willingness um, to restore fiscal uh, positions or sound fiscal positions in, um, in the future. Um, I guess the focus in the U.S. should, should be on the, on the so social security system, in particular healthcare. That's what we, what we heard yesterday. And it's always a good idea to also to underpin your you know, medium-term adjustment strategy with a, a strengthening of the budgetary framework. Now, that can increase your credibility. Markets will believe more in your, that you will actually be able in the future to, to restore sound fiscal positions. Thank you. That would be my side. Our first discussant uh, will be Dr. Dennis Jansen from Texas A&M University. Oh, they're doing it. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I will. Um, thanks for the interesting paper. Um, uh, this paper documents uh, past and current budgetary reform efforts in um, many European countries and also talks about the U.S. It identifies ambitious reformers as those whose primary expenditure cuts are more than 5% of GDP. And it discusses how these reforms were often accompanied by labor market uh, institutional reforms and privatization. Uh, the more timid reformers are also identified, including uh, the United States. So uh, my discussion, first of all, I'm going to focus on the United States. Um, it's difficult to um, discuss many European countries, although I was tempted to pick one. But um, I'm going to um, just talk about uh, the U.S., uh, near and near-term and longer-term issues and discuss um, some issues of fiscal sustainability uh, at the end. So the U.S. situation is probably well known. I don't know. Um, I, I wrote this slide before the first day of the conference, of course. So, you know, obviously we have large projected budget deficits in the near term and in the uh, longer term. Our, short, our short term uh, deficits are driven in part by the severe recession, the weak recovery and um, various uh, discretionary responses to those events. Um, the long-term budget deficits are driven by an aging population and resulting pressure on Social Security and Medicare, and also it's the seemingly ever-increasing cost of uh, medical care and, and its impact on Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, 
And, you know, even with the Budget Control Act of 2011, there's large future uh, deficits being projected. Um, I'm going to present some projections here, which I borrowed shamelessly from uh, another paper um, by other authors. But I'm going to, uh, first of all, point out that budget projections, you know, th these aren't always so useful. First of all, you have to make a lot of assumptions before you can construct these. So, you know, the CBO often, the current law remains in effect. We're going to honor our future spending commitments. Um, we're going to maintain some assumptions about economic growth and discretionary spending. And you can make small changes in these assumptions and have huge changes in deficits out in the year 2050 and so um, there's other things that go on in these projections. You know, uh, there's supposed to be Medicare uh, reimbursement cuts to physicians, and, and every chance Congress gets to uh, postpone those, they've done so this century. Um, there's supposed to be, there's an alternative minimum tax, which would bite a whole lot of us and a whole lot of people, and yet Congress, when it gets a chance, always um, postpones that day of reckoning, too. And I'm not complaining, but I'm just pointing out that these, these things get... Um, incorporated in these CBO budget projections, and yet there's not not many, I'll just say for myself, but I would suspect not many reasonable people think that actually these things are going to occur. Um, so Eddie, Auerbach and Gale have a paper, Still Tempting Fate, from August 30th, 2011, right after the, uh, the um, budget, the latest uh, budget agreement, and, and um, they present um, two two um, sets of projections. They, they have the CBO baseline projection, which you can get from the CBO, which is their, their current law projection. So the debt ceiling will be increased as needed. All the uh, temporary tax cuts, the Bush tax cuts, will expire as scheduled. And um, alternatively, there's this extended policy, which will continue the uh, tax and spending policies in place. The, the so-called Bush uh, tax cuts won't be uh, temporary. And the AMT will be um, indexed for inflation. Um, and there's also some, some other um, Medicare payments to physicians won't be cut. Um, the war spending does decline. And there's some, the discretionary spending caps imposed by the debt deal um, will occur in both of these uh, scenarios. And so here's a, the, the graph from Auerbach and Gale and the, the deficit projections over the next 10 years. And again, the CBO baseline projection might be familiar to you. And it's got the, the deficit falling to nearly 1% of GDP after about 2015. And I'll just say if the deficit falls below about 2 or 2.5% two of GDP, then if you leave out interest payments, the, the, the primary deficit is actually, you know, in surplus. And you'd see the, the debt-to-GDP ratio falling. And if the uh, deficit ends up being above 2 or 2.5% two of GDP, then you actually have a deficit even in the, the leaving out interest payments, in which case you have a primary budget deficit, and the extended policy has that. So the implications are that from these two policies, if you have the CBO baseline uh, projection, if that occurs, you'll see the deficit to GDP ratio falling. And sometimes these, uh, I mean, the, the debt to GDP ratio. And this debt is debt in the hands of the public. It's not the gross debt. So sometimes I think in the prior, in the, in the paper's presentation that the uh, debt figures were gross debt. And this is debt in the hands of the public. Extended policy, the, since the deficits are above 2 or 2.5% two of GDP, you see that the uh, Extended policy has the debt-to-GDP ratio above 80% by the end of the decade. And so there's a big gap between the uh, CBO baseline and, and Auerbach and Gale's extended policy. And um, basically, if, you know, Auerbach and Gale, are, there's nothing special here. El Elmendorf, you can find these same projections in, in Elmendorf's recent uh, paper. All right, the really bad news is in the longer run, of course. And, and so I'll, I'll have um, some graphs about that in just a second, you know, expenditures begin to rise sharply around 2020. And even the, um, the optimistic scenario has spending rising from, from like 20 to 24 percent of GDP, and the pessimistic scenario has uh, spending rising to 30 percent of GDP. And this is largely driven by the, you know, Social Security, but especially Medicare, Medicaid, and um, the aging population. Meanwhile, the optimistic revenue forecast is revenue forecast at about 21% of GDP and, and pessimistically at 18% of GDP. And, and so, uh, you know, here, here's the pictures, and you can see that after about the year 2020, the, uh, whether it's the pessimistic or the optimistic scenario on revenue, um, the, the expenditure projections are just, there, there's sort of no end in sight. The question is how steep is, is this? our expenditures growing. 
And it doesn't take much to, to realize, I mean, you've got huge gaps between spending and, exp uh, and uh, revenues, and you're going to see debt-to-GDP ratios rising really rapidly. And so based on these deficit projections, the uh, debt-to-GDP ratios are being projected. I mean, those numbers on the vertical axis are, yeah, that's 400 and 600 and 800% of GDP. And I'm here to tell you, and this is not something difficult, that that ain't going to happen. I mean, you can, you can sit here and run this through the computer, but that's not going to happen. I, I mean, even the number 200, the first ver a number above zero on the vertical axis, ain't going to happen. We're not going to have a debt of 200% of GDP. So these projections are what they are, but the, it, something's going to change. You know, and I, I think one thing that, that's missing from projections like this, and I'm, I'm not sure how you'd actually incorporate it, is just some idea of government budget balance. I mean, there is a government budget constraint. You can say the house, uh, households and government are different, but they have a constraint. And so, you know, government spending, that big G, plus interest on the outstanding debt, that's I times B, has to equal taxes plus the uh, increase in bonds, the new bonds you sell to finances uh, when you have this deficit, or uh, increases in, in H, which is high-powered money or base money. And we can write this and in, in divide by GDP, right, and make it all in, in, in per GDP terms. And so I just can change the capital G's to little g's, and it, it all pretty much follows. There's something funny that goes on with the, the lagged uh, high-powered money term, but you don't have to worry about that. The, uh, the so-called seniorage from the Federal Reserve System isn't really that big in the U.S., um, but that's the last term in brackets. And so... Um, if I just consolidate all the primary budget stuff, the, the taxes minus government spending plus that, that stuff involving high-powered money, the seniorage, and, and just call it S, that's the primary budget uh, surplus. And so, you know, one plus the interest rate times the outstanding value of bonds from, from the past has to equal the, uh, the primary budget uh, deficit plus new bonds. And then I can just nicely solve this forward through time, just keep substituting for the B, the B on the right. And, and I have this nice equation that says that uh, the current value of the outstanding debt, that's B, in, in per GDP terms, is equal to the, present, the discounted present value of all those future surpluses on the primary budget deficit that we're going to run. Right, all those, all those uh, future uh, budget surpluses. And so, you know, this, this, this should hold. And so I'm just uh, waiting for that to hold. And um, when you, So the value of our outstanding debt, which is pretty big, is equal to the value of all those outstanding future budget uh, surpluses on the primary deficit. And so at the end, I'll say, you know, and, and the debt problem in the U.S. is only a political problem. And that must be true by definition. I mean, I think we have the capacity to raise tax revenue. We don't have the will. We have the ability to cut spending. We don't have the will. You know, our options are difficult. In the past, I think we had large deficits due to wars, and those ended. And now we have large uh, projected deficits because we have all these unfunded promises to an aging population, and um, that's difficult to deal with. And I think it's going to take uh, difficult choices, and so far, I guess, uh, politicians have been unwilling to make those in, in the aggregate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They do it all. They do it all. Thank you, Dennis. Our second discussant is Dr. Matthew Murray from the University of Tennessee. Yes, coming. Yeah, I've learned the lesson from others. <laughs> well, John, thank you, and George, wherever George is, thank you, and uh, the Baker Institute for inviting me. I've had a uh, well, I've had a good time. It's been pretty depressing, um, pretty invigorating to listen to former Senator Simpson this morning and offering a little more candor and hope than we're, we're typically hearing in the uh, political arena these days. But we do have serious fiscal problems. Um, my comments on this paper, uh, I approach this from the perspective of a person who does research primarily in the state and local public finance arena, um, but I also do economic forecasting. Um, it's not like the economic forecast that the gentleman, the two gentlemen before me do because I'm forecasting the state of Tennessee's economy and the economy for the Tennessee Valley Authority, a power utility, a region. So I don't have to deal with exchange rates and interest rates and the Federal Reserve um, other than the way in which they largely affect 
uh, a state economy through macroeconomic performance. Having said that, I have to be very cognizant of what's going on in the macroeconomic arena and the global arena to understand what's going on in the economy. So, um, you know, I have to follow um, probably not all my brethren in state and local public finance are spending as much as time as I am monitoring what's going on with the national economy and, and what's going on in Europe. So I found this paper uh, by Sebastian and his colleagues to be extraordinarily helpful, very, very useful, um, because I don't typically see this kind of analysis that puts things into a common framework. Um, so it is a common, frame, common framing of the problem, uh, common data. Uh, I've got some questions about the data, and, and Tom's question earlier, I think, is kind of symptomatic of the way in which I think many, uh, at least in the United States, are going to read this paper and not really uh, understand with a great deal of clarity some of the data, simply because we're not familiar with those data. Um, the use of common historical reference points um, that I'm going to take a little exception to later on, um, and then a common outlook going forward. And then the paper ends with uh, what I think is a really nice individual and cross-cutting country focus. So it starts initially by looking country by country by country, and then puts it all together and allows you to look across countries. So I found the paper to be a, a very, very helpful uh, paper in understanding what's going on in the United States, which I'm painfully aware of, but uh, also in the, uh, the European Union. So I begin by the way I would have approached this, and when I read through the paper and I kind of look at the remarks I scribbled on the, on the paper um, and then look at these first couple of charts, the points that I'm raising here are really in the paper, but I like to see a real high-impact presentation of what the framework is to begin. Um, and I don't want to put... Uh, words in the mouths of Sebastian and co-authors, but this is my distillation of the way to think about this particular problem. Um, so I'd like to think about countries that have largely, if not uh, primarily, a cyclical problem, where the goal should be in the near term to sustain spending and aggregate demand, and then over the midterm, as you need to cut spending, it's a cyclical problem, so you may not have a compelling need, uh, but if you have to cut uh, spending, so be it. But diminished spending and improved revenue performance should largely um, eliminate the cyclical problem confronting those particular countries. Then you have another set of countries that have both a cyclical problem, but embedded in that cyclical problem is a serious structural deficit. Um, for those countries, I think the policy prescription is somewhat different. There, the need is to suspend, sustain short-term spending to promote aggregate demand, uh, and then mid-term spending uh, cuts and tax increases, depending upon uh, the nature of the country, its problems, and how it got to the structural deficit that it had and the new introduction of new policies and fiscal rules. Um, Shanna Rose's presentation yesterday afternoon was not very encouraging about how those fiscal rules might, in fact, uh, matter, and I'll return to that uh, a little bit later. But I don't think we should totally punt and give up on the introduction of new rules and so on to try to rein in uh, the structural deficits. And then I think a very important focus on compositional effects. A, a bit discouraging to see that the ambitious reformers are cutting back on investment relative to their predecessors in the 1980s and the 1990s. But the real focus here should be on promoting uh, allocative efficiency, if I can go back to kind of the Musgravian way of looking at things, but um, in the more modern language today, promoting competitiveness. Um, I don't think there's enough discussion in the paper about, tax, about taxes, about the revenue side of government budgets. It is a paper, admittedly, on expenditure reform. It's in the title. It's not about, about tax reform. Um, but I think improved... Uh, a better discussion of the importance of consumption taxes versus the alternative levies that are being used, and also uh, any, other, any other efforts that are being used by the EU countries, uh, the U.S., uh, we're not seeing any, on improving revenue productivity, revenue administration and revenue productivity. Uh, so I suffer from the common problem of someone reviewing a paper wanting to see something in it that really wasn't the focus of the paper, but I think that really is very, very important. And I don't see much of a discussion of the role of uncertainty, because I think uncertainty is one of the more fundamental problems that we have today uh, in the United States, but all through uh, the European Union today. And so I think what's really, really important today is getting policy in place not necessarily implemented, but getting the policy in place to help resolve that uncertainty that continues to loom and continues to hamper economic growth. So some rather, uh, rather 
specific, if not picky, kind of data issues here. Uh, Tom Newbig raised the question of what is total revenue. Tax revenues in the U.S. now are at the lowest share of GDP since, uh, and I don't know the exact date, late 40s, 1950, 1951, somewhere in that range. We hear that government spending is the largest share of GDP since the post-world, in, in going back to roughly the same period. But because of the shrinkage in revenues, um, and we are also seeing uh, taxes uh, plummet. And it doesn't line up with the numbers that are in the, the report, at least as is familiar from the perspective of Americans looking at budgeting and the reporting of data from the perspective of the, of the U.S. Uh, I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong with the data or anything like that. It's just that many readers coming at the problem from the U.S. perspective will not be able to translate the data. Uh, it's not clear where pensions and Social Security are versus other transfers, at least the way I think about it, um, uh, welfare in this country as we call it. Um, what I think is sorely missing is any discussion of the finances of subnational governments, and I'll come back in a moment and, and talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the historical context, when we start looking out at T0, T1, out through T7, I'd like to see in those same charts the historical data. I'm a very visual person. When I do my forecasting, when I look at macroeconomic data, and I look at the future, I like to look at the history to put that in context. I think that's very important in the context of the chart that shows real GDP growth. Because I, can't, I can only see the projection, and I can't see what the historical pattern of growth was for the countries prior to the implementation and reform. Um, spending and taxes as a share of GDP, an essential normalization uh, to understand the relative sizes. Uh, but with GDP moving and with revenues moving, I'm a data guy. I want to see the data. Um, and I'd like to see the data on both revenues and expenditures, the actual real spending data not normalized by GDP. Uh, some comments about... Uh, avoiding a repeat of the crisis. What do you do to avoid this? Uh, and again, this is you know this is another paper, perhaps. Uh, there are references in the paper to work that has looked at this particular question. Um, for many of the countries, I think we have a problem that's similar to the problem, and I use Arizona as the poster child for this, uh, in terms of the way in which Arizona has um, done a poor job over many, many years, over decades of dealing with its budget. Um, and that is during periods of economic growth, cyclical surpluses are squandered by reducing taxes, by increasing spending that is not sustainable over the course of the business cycle. During the boom, it's sustainable. But when the business cycle hits, when the contraction hits, hits, uh, the consequences are more dire than they otherwise would be. And the political process enables that uh, to happen. Um, Arizona selling its state uh, capital buildings is an example of, of one of the bad outcomes. So don't waste a good crisis, some practical options, um, multi-year budgeting. Um, forcing our policymakers to look. These aren't rules as much as they are policy guidelines to help improve the budgeting process. Multi-year budgeting, um, larger budget stabilization funds, uh, budget stabilization funds that create a fiscal externality by enhancing macroeconomic stability, uh, the budget rules that uh, uh, were mentioned yesterday that we don't have a lot of evidence that they're highly effective. Subnational governments, they're very important, and they're, they're not a major consideration in this paper and in much of the thinking about the macroeconomic consequences confronting the global economy today uh, in terms of the fiscal imbalances of the public sector. Um, very important long-term obligations on the part of the states. They have debts. Uh, they have pensions that are poorly funded. Um, you have states like New York that borrow from the pension fund to meet their funding contribution to the pension fund. Uh, interesting uh, approach to, to dealing with policy. You have serious vertical pressures that are coming about over the course of this economic downturn and its aftermath uh, because of the vert vertical hierarchy of government, federal government to state, but also state or use your whatever your country is, whatever you name your subnational units, down to the more localized levels of government. And serious long-term revenue consequences for local governments and the states going forward. Um, I'm kind of for sake of time, moving a little more quickly here, but U.S. housing starts based upon global insights forecasts for the U.S. never return to where they were before the recession. Never. Um, this is going to have really dire consequences for the property tax base because we have too much commercial property, too much manufacturing property, and we're going to have this hangover of residential property for a long time to come. Uh, sharpen the historical context. I would argue that the 1980s and 1990s isn't necessarily the best uh, framework to use to look at ambitious or not ambitious reformers today. However, it is all we have. 
Um, admittedly, that is the only experience we have. So a little bit more of a discussion about what were the similarities between the economic environment then and the economic environment today, because I think the economic environment today is markedly different. It's global, and choices today can have global consequences. Focus on consequences seven years after reform. Um, that's fine, and that's, you know, our modeling is only, you know, realistically, we can only go out so far. Um, doesn't stop me from doing forecast to 2030. I don't feel real good about it, um, but I don't lose sleep anymore about those long-term forecasts. It's still informative to go through that process. It's a process of discovery doing the forecast. I mean, people that do forecasts, I mean, I try to tell people, you take this too seriously. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a process of discovery, understanding the facts and understanding the trends and so on. But I wonder if it's really warranted today for these countries to be embarked upon the policy changes today as opposed to delaying those policy changes. And some, con uh, some con uh, discussion of whether the consequences, the adverse growth consequences today are very, very different from the growth consequences from the period of the 1980s and the 1990s. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. Uh, we are short on time, so I think what I'll do is just uh, allow Sebastian to comment to his discussants, and then he can take maybe one question, and then we're going to move on to the next session. Uh, yes, thanks a lot for these uh, very helpful comments. Um, I have to say I agree uh, to most of them. One issue I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in, because I mean also to develop the paper, is the, the data issue you mentioned. Because you were saying, okay, uh, kind of the data which is in the paper now is not very familiar to, um, to what you typically use. So that was also the case in, in your uh, discussion. Because you, I mean, you focused on CBO data, so that's federal government data. So what is in the paper is uh, general government. So this uh, includes all, all levels of, uh, of government. And that's what we, I mean, for example, the ECB typically use. And I had to use it here because if you want to do cross-country comparison, I have to use the same concept. But what would, it, what would you usually use to assess these kind of questions? Would you purely focus on, on federal? No, I think what you're using, Sebastian, is right data. I think some clarification of what's included in the different revenue categories and in the expenditure categories, because we use some different, slightly different language uh, and so on. So even earlier, you mentioned Social Security and health care, and you used, I think, I can't remember the phrase, but a comment. I think you used Social Security to include both what we call Social Security and health care. So I think yes. it's largely a semantic issue that you could resolve yeah. simply by providing some footnotes or some explanatory material on what is defined as a revenue, what's defined Don't you think as a 40, Isn't forty two percent too high for both federal, state, and local though? I've never seen a number. No, it's day. it is too high. I think it, that's it what Don was saying. Yeah, 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 I think it is too high. That's I, something I, wrong I, with this number. No, oh, it's from the IMF, I cannot <laughs> <laughs> Uh, not, not my number. Maybe just helpful to you know, find out Check what's going on. Yeah, no, no, I know. Uh, Remember, yeah. the denominator is going down, uh, or at least below capacity. But this was before the recession. I mean, no. no, 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 no. The 42 is basically at the at the high, I think, of the no, so and, and the GDP, the denominator effect. It has could very well be federal yes. and state and local combined. Yes. Sure, GDP. Yeah. That but it's certainly not typical. That would not be far from the no, 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 no. That's OECD true. has been in the range of 32, 33, 34 percent, I think. For the expenditure? For total uh, expenditure. Uh, but I haven't looked in, in recent years, so uh, it's a cycle. No, I will, I will, I will try to, do, to check that out. But I'm, I'm pretty sure about, I mean, this IMF data should be, I mean, factually it's correct. It might be a thing of what is included and what not. It does seem high. I mean, consumption is 70% of GDP. No, because it's not government spending on goods and services. It's not oh, government including right. transfers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. 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 The other thing, what about why, why the gross debt? Why not debt? In the, I mean, it matters quite a bit how you think about this. No, no, of course, that's another issue. That's the issue of yeah. debt that the U.S. owes to itself. Why would you yeah. want to talk about that? No, no, no. I mean, that's, of course, a, a question which is also discussed uh, in Europe. But our standard approach, for example, on the stability and growth pact, we always fo focus on growth debt. That's kind of a convention. So if I want to compare European countries, that's the data we use normally. But I, I get your point. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, that's always puzzling. Yeah. Yeah. Focus on growth debt. Yeah. Yeah, well.
One of your slides um, looked at uh, different patterns of reform um, depending upon uh, the whole package of reforms, uh, you know, the timid reforms, but also whether there were other elements of the reform package, whether it was regulation and tax reform. Well, is there, did you look also, though, at kind of the initial conditions under which the reform was taking place? Were they, were they doing any of these reforms in a setting where the economy was, was tanking or where the economy was growing or uh, what would those, that kind of lesson show? Because I think the concern right now in the U.S. is yeah, we need to reform things, but do you want to cut spending in, a, in, a, in an environment where we have 9.1 percent mm. unemployment, et cetera, et cetera? So initial conditions matter. That's for sure. I mean, if you look at the old periods, it's actually the case that most of the, these reform periods started after a severe recession. So That's not true. Not of the stuff that Alicina did. We looked at it very carefully. Every one of those successful fiscal consolidations was when the economies were at full employment. To the, at the beginning. Okay. I mean, there's a difference between the, the episodes they identify because they, sh they focus on improvements in the cyclically adjusted balance for a, no, I a difference. Yeah. So here, these are more longer-term reductions in spending. So and in, in this case, yes. Consolidations were in the Alberto Alicinas paper. That's the only one I know really well, and, and the ones like that yeah. were all at full employment. They're nothing like what yeah. the United States. But it's a different definition, just as, I mean, our definition is a different one. We focus on spending, and in this, it was the case that actually in most of the one, it was following a, a severe recession. That's a fact. Um, but, I mean, yeah, the initial condition, of it's the question when to start the adjustment. No? That, that's very clear. The thing is, I mean, in Europe you have, you have the problem that um, a lot of the countries, they don't have a chance, no? because financial pressures are so high at the moment, especially for the pro countries, but also starting in Italy, that, I mean, there is no other way as a pro-cyclic fiscal tightening at the moment. Of course, the situation in the U.S. is, is different, no? because there is still financing conditions have not worsened uh, similar. Let's go to the last question. Uh, I'm worried about comparability uh, of data in a slightly broader sense, looking at the United States versus the European countries in particular. Uh, uh, the first is, of course, that the United States is a tax expenditure junkie. And as a result, I think you're not picking up large amounts of, of government spending in the form of tax expenditures, uh, which is uh, much larger for the United States. Uh, second, in terms of, of, of thinking about the mix of, of prescriptions going forward, the United States is an outlier in another area, uh, which is military, where we spend 42% of the world's spending on military. Uh, and so, you know, cutting back, I don't mean to pick on anything, but cutting back France's military expenditures is not as important to France GDP as cutting back the U.S. would be. And third, health care which is special in so many ways. Uh, uh, the U.S. spends about 50% more, if you combine public and private, 50% more per capita than any other country in the world. And I think of, from my you know, personal perspective, I don't care very much whether it's public spending or private spending on my health. Either way, it's a tax on me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I wonder whether it might not be more appropriate to at least think about looking at health care on a public plus private combined uh, basis, because if you kick out public spending on health care and it's just dollar for dollar picked up by <coughs> citizens, uh, we still have the most inefficient and overpriced health care in the world, and it's still an effective tax on ourselves. No, I mean, I fully agree. It's very difficult to compare the U.S. That's my alternative to die. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's always an alternative. All, all my ex-wives agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 And have, I mean, we also have tax expenditure in, the, in Europe, for example. And this would be very difficult to square. No, it's a magnitude. That's yeah. Orders of magnitude. Yeah. As they do, they do. And they're value added taxes. Yeah. It would the be interesting to actually. Of, uh, income tax. Uh, I think that would be an interesting paper to figure out how the tax expenditures compare. I mean, an actual laying it out because the, the, the VAT, I mean, a value added tax, if you have a narrow base, and that must be a tax expenditure. Yeah. Right. Oh, but it would be more like a new paper. No, exactly. No, I am not suggesting that for your current paper, but but 